Welcome back to Design in Process. This is episode three, attempt number two, because I have already filmed this once and I messed up all of the audio and all of the videos. So I've redone it. And I am so pleased that Amfisa is back again to do the interview because it is so jam-packed, full of knowledge about user experience, personas, target market. So sit back, relax, take notes, because this is a crazy, insightful interview. Enjoy. Okay, so let's jump straight into it. Um, thank you so much for joining me again. Welcome. <laughs> if you could tell everyone at home a little bit about you, same as we did before, a minute or two, just about your background. Right, okay. So my name is Alfisa and I'm a UX designer freelancer. I kind of start up in the past and uh, just recently started a huge project with one corporation, so figuring out that new culture. Uh, basically, as a freelancer, I'm working a lot with like startups as well as uh, some existing startups who wants to grow or fix their problems. And if it's coming to the corporations right now, I'm working with design systems, so it's different puzzles. But yeah, somewhere there. Cool. So I know you from Instagram and I follow your content a lot and you talk about how UX designers, you, well, you talk about a lot of theory about UX design as well and right. designing for people. So what I wanna get across to my uh, viewers watching this is why is it so important to define who you're designing for before you start designing yeah. the, the products? Because basically if you don't design it for others and you don't know for who you're designing, you design it for yourself. I think like if you're designing it uh, just because you like it, it's kind of an art. And I don't know if you know how to sell art, but I think like selling art is very expensive and very hard and very complicated to do it. Like I don't think that selling art is a very good profitable business model. So if you want to sell what you're doing and you want to make sure that the product you're building or whatever it is, digital thing you're building, kind of succeeds you need to know for whom you're designing because these people uh have totally different mindset that you have totally different questions different different search inquiries um mental models and you need to address these otherwise if you're not doing this you're doing it for yourself most probably only you will use it and i guess you <laughs> you cannot pay your own bills if you don't take money from somewhere else <laughs> yeah so that's that's a really good point so it's about changing your mindset so you can design for other people that don't think the same as you necessarily. And it's, uh, it's defining that mindset as well. Right, exactly. It's like you're putting yourself into the sh like classic quote, putting yourself into the other's shoes. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So if there's a designer starting out um, and they're looking to go into UX design or product design and they know that they need to start defining their target market or they know that they need to start defining their specific user. What are some of the things that they can do? So what are some of the tasks they can do? And what are some of the mistakes that people make as well? Mm -hmm. Let me start from the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. So let's like imagine the situation. So client comes to you and says like, hey, we are going to build this new product or this new feature whatsoever. And you're like, okay, what am I supposed to do? First thing first, you need to ask who you're targeting, what market segment you are targeting and trying to kind of help with cover. And from that segment, it's kind of your like first input from the client. You understand at least where in this world what kind of piece of a cake you're trying to target. From that place, you start actually getting into that particular segment. And from there, uh, first, of course, you need to, also client will define for you the like demographic, let's say, uh, constraints or, I don't know, situation, statuses, uh, living situation, I don't know, even like, yeah, all these demographic data the client must define for you so that you have like a starting point. From there, you need to screen these people in the surveys and kind of filter away people you don't need who doesn't fit these requirements and uh, don't take them for the interview. However, people who fit your requirements, uh, you can do two things. Either in the survey, you can also figure out, kind of ask them uh, some questions about your assumptions or validate some ideas that you might already brainstorm somewhere or research in the secondary research so you can either immediately in the survey ask uh, and validate your ideas or you can just screen people that uh, fit your 
demographic area and uh, invite these people for the interviews. And then during the interviews, you can finally kind of have in-depth conversation. Uh, my, my advice here is that I really suggest you to kind of have like a test conversation, maybe with a client, maybe with your dog, with your friend, with whoever, and you will see the dynamic of a uh, conversation in this topic. You will see what kind of questions you can ask, how people will react in this or another question, and how can you kind of navigate this conversation. And then based on this conversation, based on the assumptions you've built, you can start preparing the agenda for this user interview. And then in the user interview, you'll start understanding the patterns. After 10 interviews, you'll start seeing how the dots connect. You will put it on the paper, you compare, and you will start defining the personas that will help you to move on in the project. Mm. That's really interesting. And I think you touched on something at the very end there that I think is really important as well, because I think, and it was the same for me when I was first starting out, the general assumption is you need to interview so many people and you need to have like thousands of like participants yeah. to get the data. But you yeah. said there are 10 interviews. And I, start, I, I personally think if you start to hear the same thing 10 times, then that can prove the theories that you have and, and give you those insights already from just 10 people. Do you find that as well? Yeah, of course. Uh, I guess it's just right now we're talking about theory, but as soon as you start practicing, whoever, like designer, new designer, old designer, every time you start into your, you immediately start seeing connections or you start seeing sense in this or another piece of information. And right now we're talking about something very general, abstract, but again, in the practice, you'll start seeing it. And so it will go without saying, actually. Um, and for sure, in my practice, I don't even do more than five to eight interviews because we pre preliminary defined, let's say, here's our target, here are the segments from the survey, we can see this segment is like inspirational, this one is practical. Now let's interview those two representatives of these two things, so four from this category, four from this, or three, three, whatever. And after a few interviews, you'll literally see the same answers. Yeah, they will vary a little bit here and there, uh, but essentially you will get the same vibe and you will start putting these patterns on the paper, compare them, connect the dots and see kind of how can you build a real like uh, generalized persona from these patterns. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So uh, let's say, for example, that I will be designing a light for a client called Gantry Design. It will be sold on their store, so I need to be able to uh, appeal to their demographic in their target market. What should be the first steps that I do to uh, make sure I align myself with, with their market? Right. It's interesting. Uh, so I'm not sure how actually open they are about their users. Is it possible for you to get some data from them, from analytics, or even if it's possible to kind of do the preliminary search, surveys whatsoever, emails, um, or it's kind of blind guess at, at the moment. Or you can maybe like pick up some users that you see leaving comments and just interview them themselves. How is the situation there? That's really interesting and I hadn't even thought to ask them about okay. their demographic. So that's, I think that you, we've just defined step one <laughs> is, is ask them their, their demographic. So that's really cool. I really like the idea of, uh, of going and seeing who's commenting on their photos and I can get a, a general idea through that way maybe, but maybe to get some actual evidence and they say it's this type of people from 20 to 35, you know, that type of thing. That'd yeah. be a good start, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but also it's important to understand if like even the, that you have this, you know, demographic or marketing persona, would you be able to talk to them? Like, or is it just gonna be like, maybe somehow these people will be from your audience and you can also interview them? Cause it's gonna like, you can blind guess it, you can kind of pick random people that maybe don't exactly fit the demographic portrait of the generalized persona, but even a few insights may help. Um, when it's a little bit closed environment, you will have to play this guessing game, but at least you can get at least it's like some scope, some marks that you can orient on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. So I think that's this week's task is to make sure that I start to interact with the people that might be buying it. So already straight off the bat, I know that the, the lamps are only sold in the US and Canada. Uh -huh. So I could put out a screen and say, you know, are you in the US and Canada? Like that, like that's stage one. <laughs> 
yeah but again from there before even like going to talk to them you need to have some assumptions or something that you need to verify or have a goals for this user interview and when you have this agenda and you're in front of your eyes you feel more confident about navigating it if it's just like hey what do you like do you like red or blue <laughs> then it's very generalized you need to have these specific things in your mind when you come to this interview mm -hmm. so i get so in that case my task should be i need to form a general idea about these people to begin with once i have that general idea i can go and start to interview them and that's either gonna clarify the idea or or change it slightly to to be what it actually is yes i call it like assumptions like definitely i do the secondary research and create my vision of it which also sometimes people even use it for like a general project from like let's say forum comments you can define who you're targeting but you didn't talk to them actually and based on these assumptions you can immediately start creating something or you can actually go and talk to these people um, ask about their lifestyle about ask about their uh how they are looking for things what they're looking how what are the criteria they are looking for uh also make them uh, some practical tasks so it's, there is two types of questions you can ask one is directed one is indirected and when you ask directed questions you just First, when you ask actually first indirect questions, you just ask them about their opinions and they all start, yeah, I do this, I do that, I like this or that, I like that. But when you ask them, let's imagine you're going to buy this from this place whatsoever, um, and you, if you give them a task and ask them to kind of do this task in front of you and comment while they're doing it, you can actually see how words match with the actions and that's going to create like a realistic picture for you so that, that you know, <laughs> that makes sense right now. Mm. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, because a lot of the time people might say one thing as they're doing the task and then maybe they're, they're showing something else. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's very time often happens. And sometimes even in the interviews, uh, I had I had like few interviews in Skype from mobile phone where they were not able to share with me the screen. And we first discussed just like how they like it. But then I started to kind of even like role play in the situation where I'm imaginatively imaginatively totally, they would go to some website and I would ask this and that and they would just start commenting what they would do and it appeared they didn't know why would they do differently than they said and then they start reverse engineering their own behaviors and it also gives a lot of insights actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next question that I want to ask let's say for example this week I start to form ideas about the target audience and I manage to uh, collaborate that with some evidence. Further down the line how can I, or how do you keep those personas in mind when you're designing three, four, five months down the line? How do you keep coming back to that original persona? Many people think that persona is just like, a, I've done it for a check mark and I forget about it in a day. That's a wrong approach. Um, personas are here for you, for, for like, for helping you to move on to things. And you have to approach it the same way. You have to look at it more emotionally. You have to use it as like literally emotional portrait. Have a connection with this. Uh, have a feelings about it. When you see, even when I design the personas, I try to add any color coding or any kind of icons there that will remind me the feeling that I got from these users. For example, if it's like, eccentric or not eccentric, let's say uh, extrovertive, active person who's, I don't know, traveling a lot or whatsoever. I know that this is kind of a red. She's like bold. She's like very active. I'm going to put a lot of red in there. I'm going to add the icons. I'm going to add the brands that she, she likes. And I'm going to associate her with this feeling. Um, try to do this as well. Like try to, and again, if you created this persona, make as realistic and like as emotional as you can to, for your own self. And even feel free to put it on your wall in front of you while designing it for her. Here's she's supposed, or here she, she's supposed to be the reference for you when you're designing it. So as soon as you glance over this person on your wall, you immediately remember how does it feel? What does it mean? How do I think? Put yourself into that skin and start feeling that way. Um, it's not just like document to put in your shelf. It's, it's a reference for you to always keep in mind when you have to design. Because again, there are many tasks you'll have to do and it's kind of easy to get out of these shoes and then to get back into that feeling and shoes, you'll have to have this emotional reference for yourself. And if you're not able to, um, let's say you created this persona and then somebody else has to use it, make sure to explain them why you created it or maybe explain them how you created it so that maybe they can create it themselves for their own reference. So just like 
this is a tool to help you, not to store in the shelf. Yeah, that's great. And I think I'm guilty of that as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where, many people are. <laughs> yeah, where, like especially at university, um, that would, like you said, just I've done that, tick the box, get the marks and move on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's great. That's some great advice. <laughs> cool. Uh, I mean, I think those are all the questions that I wanted to go through and it's really helped with some specific things that I need to get done this week. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot to do because this, this process of personas and, and, and deciding who I'm actually designing for can take weeks and months, right? Especially with a, with a big project. It's, yeah. it's not a one weekend uh, task to do. It's, it's a big old uh, task, especially for the bigger projects. Mm -hmm. Just so I know the, the scope of work that you've been working on, how long or what's the longest project that you've worked on for, for that yeah. specific bit? So there is a difference between university projects and, and actual real case projects. I've also been in university and our typical project, we've been also introduced to double diamond project process there. And uh, of course we were following it pretty like step by step. And I think that's, that process is more about theory and practicing and getting into that kind of vibe, right? Like just practicing it a little bit. And there you have to do every step. But in real case, you would cut some things. Like in theory, you have to do one, two, three. In practice, you do one, three. Because you know already how to make shortcuts and you definitely cut, you kind of cut out the time uh, to make it more efficient. And uh, in university also, it's a first time trial. It's um, kind of more approach. Sometimes it's really just to please your professors or whoever. And it's not always about life. But in life, you will figure out how to make it faster, better, quicker, more efficient. So I don't know. Like in university, I think each project was like three, six months. Six months, I think. Yeah, each semester we had one big project, teamwork, and so on. But in life, I would say three months enough, definitely, uh, for everything. The biggest issue with the time is when you have to conduct actual those interviews and everybody, especially if it's different time zones, everybody is having different time, free times and you have to negotiate, you have to find this time and you have to reward these people for this time and then if it's a different time zones, you sleep, they, they work it's a, and so on. It's a challenge. Uh, so for me, sometimes just interviewing stage could take a month. But before that and after that, it's pretty straightforward. So it's kind of pretty quick. Right, yeah. That's great. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, yeah, it's, it's great to go through this stuff again, because obviously with the time before, I learned about all this stuff. And in this time, hearing it again, it's like solidifying exactly what yeah. I need to do. <laughs> I remember when I was like learning what is actually used, how to apply it. It was for me the same. Like in university, I was like, yeah, there's something like, okay, whatever. Like I didn't get it like seriously it was like i was listening to it oh, maybe something okay good looks good and then i was accidentally practicing it because of some startups and then i was teaching it and then when i was teaching it i finally started understanding it. it's like three times repeated and then you start feeling it and getting it <laughs> yeah <laughs> so maybe if once i've done all these tasks this week then i'll finally start to understand it a little bit more as well yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let everyone know at home where they can find you if they want to check out your work online. Where's best to check out all your work? Uh, I don't have work, but I have Instagram. <laughs> My portfolio is nowhere. I don't even have a portfolio, but I have Instagram where I share all the puzzles, all the lessons, so maybe some educational costs, and also launching the course this week. So Instagram is a challenge a channel to go <laughs> and right. sign. Cool. Thank you so much. So I now know exactly what I need to do this week in order to define my personas and my target audience and the specific person that I will be designing for. So thank you so much to Anfisa for that amazing interview. Don't forget to go and follow her on Instagram at Anfisign. And next week, I'm going to be putting this information into practice. So stick around for that. If you learned anything in this video, don't forget to let me know down in the comments below. I love to hear about it. And don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell button and everything else that YouTube asks you to do. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.